Hello everyone and welcome. You're listening to the TSE Talks, the place to be to learn more and explore the life in Magenta. You wonder what's going on in the company? Where do we excel and what's our lessons learned? Join me as I delve into the life in DTSE and interview employees as well as guests to answer all your questions. I'm your host, Umi Mabuswab, and today we talk about effective communication. Therefore, I invited the head of communication in DTSE, Andre Diebeck, and Anne Wenders, a senior expert in corporate communication in Deutsche Telekom, to discuss with them the ins and outs of effective communication in our current times. So stick around. Communication has always been extremely important. However, its significance has amped up even more during the coronavirus pandemic. Communication virtually is no longer a convenience. It seems to be now a necessity. So as we transitioned to online collaboration, we all quickly became aware of the different ways Effective communication is playing a role in shaping our relationships and our well-being in general. Today's conversation is centered around effective communication in today's virtual work, especially on how to make sure people are engaged and motivated. So without further ado, let's get started. Our guests today are Dr. Andre Diebeck, the Operating Officer and Senior Vice President of Customer and Communication Management in DTSE, and Anne Wenders, a senior expert in corporate communications in Deutsche Telekom AG. They're here with us today to discuss the effective communication in today's virtual work and precisely how to make sure people are engaged and motivated. Andre and Anna, thanks so much for joining me today. I'm glad that you're here with me. Hi, May. Thanks for having us here. Thanks, May, for the invitation. Happy to be here with you. Thank you for being here. So. Today, we'll be talking about communication and the critical role it's playing. And um, since you are communication experts, you're invited here to talk about these subjects. But before we get to the discussion, I want to know a little bit about your background. So can you share with us shortly how you got to the role you're doing today? Maybe, Andre, we can start with you. <laughs> yeah, I'm more than happy to, to share some insights. Uh, so, yeah, it's... Um... For seven years now, I'm in shared service um, environment and um, I joined DT double the time, so 15, 16 years ago. Um, wow. First, re <laughs> HR-related stuff from a central position, so um, I experienced some headquarters work. And afterwards, mm -hmm. um, I decided to go into shared service center, first focusing on HR-related uh, stuff. And always I had... Um, the yeah communication role it was not only with my team in the very beginning but then communication about the projects i were involved so and then it developed um, since we have founded dtse five and a half years ago um, that was really related to a strong communication role because um, we have three thousand employees uh, across europe um, we need some internal and um, bit of external communication inside mm -hmm. the group. Um, so that is my way to communication. And um, yeah, before joining Telecom, um, just to, to make this uh, picture complete, I was working for business consultancy and um, had an academic um, education as a neurobiologist. But this is something we might want to talk in a second podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Uh, and what about you, Anna? How did you get yeah. to your current role? Um, yeah, very happy to share. So I've um, I've been with Deutsche Telekom not quite as long as Andre, but I think it's um, well, it will be eleven years now. I think not quite as long. <laughs> <laughs> Just four years. That's short. true. <laughs> but but having said this, um, I'm similarly long um, in communications because basically yeah. I have spent my whole professional life in communications in various stages. I've been working at newspapers, at news agencies, at PR, at PR agencies, at various companies in the corporate communications department. And then, um, yeah, almost 11 years ago, I joined um, Deutsche Telekom and the corporate communications department at the um, headquarters in Bonn. Um, I had various roles there as well. For example, um, I was doing HR communication. Mm -hmm. After my maternity leave, actually, I had a short period in time where I was doing the speech writing for our Sea level management, which was an interesting experience as well, and well, now for the last I think two, two almost two years, I'm um, responsible for the 
Europe communication, that is the communication with our 10 uh, NATCOs, um, meaning that uh, we are aligning our messaging. We have to make sure that the information flow in both directions is up and running. And um, yeah, to make sure that our messaging is clear and that we are aligned mm -hmm. in our messaging and in our topics. This is the one part. And the second part is our not so new board member for Europe, Dominique Leroy, um, to pos position her um, uh, communi in, in communicative um, ways. This is um, the second task that um, yeah, we take care of. So this is what we are occupied with at the moment. Great. Thank you for sharing your, your experience and your background with us. So I see now you're really in the field of communication for a long time. So you're the right persons for the questions that I am about to bring. <laughs> Hopefully. So some people are working from home for the first time. Some people are working from home differently this time, just with uh, kids or with families. And we see that the communication here is a bit uh, changed with the mindset. We've, we're feeling that there's a change. Some feeling that there's a lack of communication. So how did you see that this uh, challenges has affected the the way people are engaged. Um, with in-person meetings, you there are many many moments of engagement that happen before or during or after the meeting, and that help people remain engaged. Be mm -hmm. you know the smile during a meeting, or or you know you, you pat someone on the back and say hey well done, or the small talk at the coffee machine. All these moments really really help people to to stay connected and also to stay present in this you know moment. And if you want to win virtually, so to say, I think it is really essential to move away just from your delivery of information mindset to try to engage and inspire the participants. And I think there, um, this is something that we really need to make sure that um, socializing virtually, and there are various ways, I think, this, which don't always have to be very time consuming, mm -hmm. um, are essentially um, um, are essential when you really want to make sure that people are uh, following you and, um, you know, remain engaged mm -hmm. um, in this specific meeting. Yeah. So we have a lot of daily meetings, leaders meetings, um, team meetings, so many of the meetings. And uh, at the end, you still feel like you're not engaged. So we should be a little bit more uh, creative here. From my point of view, um, what, what I experience with my direct team is, um, for the first time, um, we um, we had the the situation that not one size fits all. So take take just a Joe fix uh, with the team. I'm not talking about complete enterprise communication now. V very close to your um, to your directs where you are. You have your daily task. Um, you really have to be um, to be sure that you talk about this, the same thing. And it's not possible if ten people are in a virtual room. And uh, that took some time um, because in the beginning of the pandemic, um, we were running around solving problems, jumping into details, and uh, it was kind of stressy and hectic. And then the day-to-day -day tasks need to be organized a little bit different. Mm -hmm. yeah? People had to find a new balance. We're, we're still looking for that new balance, by the way. Yeah, um, All enterprises are talking about the new way of working or whatever they call it in the projects. From a communication point of view, it needs to be clear if it comes to concrete actions and tasks, you have to maybe talk only to one or two people, um, like you do normally maybe in, in your office. You say, hey, let's talk about this and that. Um, you can't then do that in a big group because if you do it, you bore eight people if you only talk to one about a task. And this is then, yeah, that they don't want to do it and they then tend to, to get away from the table, from the virtual table. So you have to be more selective if it comes to details and uh, still have to keep the team yeah, up to date with some broader messages, zooming out and tell them the, end, the complete direction is still the same yeah, and uh, that they understand how their work is related to that. Yeah, and also make sure that people feel responsible. I mean, I think... Um, uh -huh. So if everybody you know, is responsible, then nobody feels responsible. And I think you have the same effect somehow sometimes in the meetings. And this is even worse in a, in a virtual setting. So you really have to make somehow sure that, that people don't, you know, hide and establish. We established actually in our team meeting, um, uh, nowhere to hide rules, so to say, so that we really make sure we give people tasks beforehand 
Um, we use breakout sessions. I mean, there are many, many possibilities with um, the technologies that we are using um, within Deutsche Telekom. So we really have to make sure that people, you know, they don't dive away, but are actively um, involved. Otherwise, you have this uh, diffusion of responsibility because people just, you know, shy away um, from involving themselves in, in, you know, in too many virtual meetings one after the other. Hmm. It's good that you mentioned the responsibility because I, we're wondering what, whose responsibility it is to have this effective communication. Because whenever you ask uh, about how can we improve work in, in the corporate or in the company or what can we fix? It always seems to be communication. So everyone will answer that there's a problem with communication. I don't know what's going on in the company or information doesn't cascade down. And then the responsibility will be moving from one person to another. So who's responsible here in the corporate? Is it the employees or is it all on the leaders to engage the people? I guess it's uh, not the one way or the other. So it's, a, it's, mm -hmm. it's a push and pull. Yeah, for sure. The, the classical communication tell the next line of in the old school vocabulary in the in the hierarchy is responsible to inform the next level. This is something the working world is, is currently experienced change in, in that. But what you can do is that you can inform some people um, a little bit beforehand and they make sure that the information that will come across other channels, not only via a mail or via WebEx call or whatever, will then be distributed accordingly to the teams. Because um, if, if we take an example, if, if let's go back to this new working stuff. Uh, if we now have some decisions how this can go or not go, what do we want, um, then It's not necessarily that uh, the leaders then only pick some sentences of a bigger communication and tell their team, but they should bring it in a broader picture. And the team um, or the employees overall should then have access to the overall information, pick themselves that. And in, in a kind of self-responsibility, they, on the one hand, select what they are consuming and what they applies for them. But on the other hand, they can ask questions, why do we do it like this? So but the reasoning, and that can give you, can, can give leaders, for example, um, the chance to explain a little bit. And mm -hmm. they have the possibility without repeating the message, they can react. And with a positive redundancy, they can bring again the same message across, but they have the chance to react on feedback. And this is very important because um, uh, otherwise it's boring. I would say effective leadership is all about, you know, communicating effectively. And I think If you see what effective leaders do in a, in a very sort of, you know, outstanding way, I, I think it's always that you have a sense that strong leaders know the value of some basic qualities um, around communication that are absolutely timelessly valid, so to say. And um, I think this also applies for our sort of messaging. And I think if you take, for example, the point of clarity, I mean, effective leadership is, uh, communication is clear, it's simple, it's, you know, it's, it's not vague when you're discussing what you want from your team, for example. And I think this applies for leaders, but also, you know, for if you, ca you can cascade it down to any other relationship. So it's personalized, for example, you have to communicate transparently. I mean, even if you cannot say everything that you know, you have to make at least transparent that you cannot talk about it instead of, you know, coming with half truth, for example, because this is when you actually definitely will lose um, your, your, your people's trust. You have to have listening capabilities. You have to be, you know, in the position that you ask actively for, for feedback. And last but not least, you have, of course, to inspire the people with, with what you say, because otherwise you don't have sort of, you know, you, you just don't have the right to take that time um, to listen to you. And I think these timeless principles, which are very, very sort of you know, well, self-understanding in a way, they are really, I think, they, they are sort of the, the, the cherry on the cake when it comes to effective communication that allows repetition without boring people. Yeah, and I think you have to give the people what they need when they need it. And I think the pandemic was a really, really great example for this. So um, the people's, people's information, they need to evolve, for example, in a crisis. So, and so should your, your, your messaging also evolve. So at the beginning of the pandemic, 
will not um, you will not distill for them meaning from from the chaos that they are just facing. This comes at a later stage, you know. So you have to adjust the messages to where people are at the specific point in time, and then just communicate, as I said, along the principles of clarity, simplicity, frequency, yeah, and and emotionality. I would say. Interesting, but. Isn't there a little bit of yeah a risk that this this information is not cascaded down properly or with the same energy or with the same uh, enthusiasm, for example? Uh, this is actually a question we got from Michelangelo Ishia, wondering how to be sure that this cascading down of effective uh, communica- effective communication uh, happens when there are yeah different people in this process. When you ask for effective um communication or effective cascading of communication. I think there are still the two big C's that every communicator, I think, learns in, in you know, in their first year. And this is always consistency and coordination. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have to make sure that everything that goes out to employees or that goes out externally um, is consistent and is coordinated at one, you know, at one place. And this, of course, involves a careful planning, a careful aligning across all silos so to say so at mm-hmm. least now we all see that there is no time for um you know for silos anymore and i think one aspect that um andre already mentioned um is really valid here as well this is the aspect of um repetition i think it really is essential to repeat your key messages even if you as communicator have the feeling oh i've, I've said that so many times you know you i think you should not infer from yourself to to the target group but I think you should make sure, you know, that you um, you do repeat and do repeat effectively. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I have here another questions from, from Michaela Drost and it's, yeah, same um, in the same direction. Have we figure out, figured out some best practices for having this um, effective communication that when you, yeah, when you pass in the communication from a person to another, that you make sure it goes effectively and passes this to everyone and how to make sure that these people are on the same page always. Well, this is a good one from Michaela. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, the, the, what comes to my mind is um, I tell something um, to person A um, and ask, please tell to person B. And then I'm going one day later to person B and say, hey, what have you heard from person A? Um, this is not possible to do it like this. Mm-hmm. But what you can do is um, when, when it comes that you, you push, push a message um, important for the organization to, let's say, a section of people. And um, if you then hear it back or if you then start discussion a couple of days later about what has happened and uh, how it was understood, um, that you can then from this feedback and when people talk about what has been said, that you can take, if necessary, corrective um, corrective measures and repeat the message again. Um, but I, I would not tend to control if a message has been put across in the same wording. Um, yeah, it's just, it's more talking about the understanding. Yeah, this is, is one thing mm-hmm. um, that, that comes to my mind. Um, you know, we, we're overall changing to, to agile work style and um, we say, goodbye to key performance indicators and talking more about objectives and key results. Um, talking about on what do you want as an objective and what is the result you expect or what you what you say this I want to achieve. More on this level, you can maybe imagine to um, to be sure that the, the message is transported in different words, but with the same meaning. Yeah, that's a... Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Maybe, maybe I can add one more example from, from our department because we have the challenge to make sure that uh, 130, you know, corporate um, communicators are on the same page every day, so to say. Um, I think to answer this question quite honestly, even though it's not a very sexy answer, maybe I think it really is a sort of, you know, balanced and targeted alignment of meetings and processes that are sort of just necessary. And I think you have to have compulsory alignment meetings and um, mm-hmm. for example corporate comms we have um two fixed and and binding binding meetings for everybody every day so we call it morning and afternoon round it is led by a by a chief editor we call it just analog to you know to how media work 
um, mm -hmm. for the respective week. And then we discuss the most important topics of the media. We discuss the larger political background in which we place our messages. We discuss, you know, the comms activities that are relevant on this day, not just ours, but also that is of our competitors. We, um, you know, we, we evaluate the, the social media feedback, for example, that is relevant for everybody. So we just, you know, bring everything on the table that is relevant for all topic owners and project leaders um, to, to make effective communication and to make sure that the messages are aligned and that everybody knows that everybody is on the same page. And if, I think if mm -hmm. this really sounds a lot now, but if it is managed very clearly and in a very focused way, and if it's a sort of established process, um, it doesn't really have to take more than 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and it really is essential to have this look beyond your own horizon <laughs> to make sure mm -hmm. that, um, that the other one knows as well and is on the same page um, as you are. Understandable, yeah. It's also good to have a structure. Of course, it, it's not, it shouldn't be very, very strict, but a structure also helps with uh, following the, yeah, making sure that everyone is, is on the same page. But how do you set up this healthy and effective communication strategy in this environment uh, so that you engage people, but at the same time, you don't overload them? I was just uh, thinking what could be a good example directly from the workbench. And um, as, um, and I guess the top five priorities of DTSE we have defined, and I don't want to go into detail now on those top five priorities, just important that as more than one, um, you have to play um, mm -hmm. over the entire year and maybe beyond. And uh, what we thought about as, as communicators, now talking about the internal uh, shared service DTSE itself, we said, hey, let's come up um, with those five priorities in the different newsletters we have. So one must know to our listeners here that we send it out every five to six weeks. Um, we are collecting some uh, internal uh, information, typical newsletter style, but we dedicate the newsletter then to one or maybe two um, of our top five priorities and we explain them how they are interlinked and um, in between we are then coming up maybe with some special information and go down really go down to uh, what our people are doing and we are taking projects that are paying into one or maybe two of those top five priorities to make it very tangible and then we have the chance to get kind of mm -hmm top-down communication via a newsletter, which is spread it to everyone. Um, on the other hand, we then have projects that are reporting about their successes or about uh, their progress. They also can then take relation and, and, bring, and, and bring across the bridge to the top five priorities and say, and we, are, we have this project because we are paying into this strategic topic. And this is something that I hope this, it's pretty much the same as it works in DT, at least the experience over the last year within this DT, it was always the same. How do you pay in for something? And then combined with the, those new kind of new methods, storytelling, bring emotions, show pictures instead of tables. Yeah, mm -hmm. You still can use numbers, mm -hmm. yeah? but bring a picture and people might remember. And then when they are open, then you can put in the message and they are able to repeat it in their own words, then then it's very effective and it's a kind of redundancy without being boring. Yeah. And I think it makes it easier if you help people to experience um, what you inform them about as opposed to just consuming it. So this makes, you know, in any sort of emotional communication uh, tangible as well, because, um, you know, if people experience what they what they are told, um, it will have a, a completely different impact, of course, than just um, if they're just told what you want to convey as a message. And I think the coming back to the storytelling aspect, I think why this is such a charming sort of clue is that it can easily be uh, digested by the human brain because the human brain is, so to say, it's, I think it's, it's, it's wired for stories um, between they often don't distinguish between what is fiction, what is, what is reality. Um, in any case, the best thing is that I can relate to it and um, it, it helps sort of bridging between, you know, our, yeah, our logos and our pathos as, as the Greeks would probably say. So um, one more point to add, I think you don't have to be a natural born a novelist to come up with a good story. I think this is not what the concept of storytelling or emotional communication is about because 
creating a narrative, for example, isn't hard at all. We are actually doing this every day. So maybe if you if you think this aspect of storytelling is a little uh, weird, you can also we have narratives um, everywhere in the in the company, and um, humans have been telling stories um, for thousands of years. So so from you know from from calf painting to uh, how did I get the, to the post office? Interesting. So basically, if you want your audience to experience what you're talking about, just remember the principle of storytelling and, and use the emotions. And since we're talking about, yeah, it's been now one year and a half. So we tried some things. We tried some things that worked, some things that failed. So what are our lessons learned here after one year and a half, especially with, um, I have a question here from Sergei Holmetskis, especially with the virtual uh, settings. So what worked and what did not in engaging people? I, I would say uh, one learning is keep your meetings as short as necessary mm -hmm. i mean this is even more you know this is even more relevant in the virtual world i would say keep it uh, you know short and concise i would always say try um, if you are in virtual settings as i said you know try to integrate socializing aspects be it icebreaker questions at the beginning i mean there are very many very small sort of uh, signals to set people off in a meeting integrate for example this is what we did offline experience also into virtual settings um For example, beverage testings or any sort of events or giveaways that you sent beforehand to the people. If you have an event and, and you know, come back to this in the meeting and um, include virtual networking, for example. So, so you know, use the, um, the we did a format which was actually quite well received. We had our telecom management top meeting at the beginning of the year. And for the first time ever, it was, of course, in a really virtual setting. So this is our roughly 1,000 top, top managers within Deutsche Telekom. And um, the networking aspect always is a very, very, you know, big asset of this event. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you know, we had to find different ways this time. And we did sort of chat roulette, which is now, you know, which can be done with any WebEx by now. Um, and where you are randomly assigned, you know, to a small chat group and where you're so to say, where you are sort of forced, you know, to get to know people. But then again, you know, very short, very precise. And then you switch to the next. Um, and people really like that format. The feedback on this, for example, was really, really good. So this chat roulette, for example, now has a rather established place in many, many um, yeah longer meetings and events um, that we are mm. that we are doing. Yeah. Okay. All right. How about uh, in DTSE, Andre? Yeah, for for sure. We 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 use this kind of uh, methods as well. And uh, again, here, um, yeah, ex direct example from meeting with your team or meeting in larger group. But what I experienced, what uh, worked uh, very well, but took some time to establish is when you dial into the WebEx, which was uh, our most uh, used tool for sure. Um, if you dial in and the, the first partner is coming, and even if you expect 20 or 25 people in the session, don't be silent. Start directly yeah. because not normally it, it's just a small thing. But if you are sitting in a room and somebody yeah. is entering, You would not keep your mouth shut and somebody True. else is taking place. True, you yeah. would say, at least you would say hello. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you also say your name and then you start talking. How do you feel? What was your experience today? If it's a meeting in the afternoon, start conversation. Don't skip this important part. You can do this in the virtual world. And um, this is one thing. And then most of the icebreakers that you're normally using when kicking off a project or coming together in a workshop situation, um they are also working um uh, online mm -hmm. like um yeah asking people to to talk about um a good or a bad uh, experience on the day yeah or something like this and and then people um are, are really get relaxed and are open for for the next uh, next session um and accidentally um in in direct in, in my team it happens that um, when I went into the WebEx uh, giving debriefs or information sessions to my team, sometimes I tend to forget something. And, and normally um, we come all together, then I start the debriefing and uh, then we do the round. And then everyone is uh, uh, throwing out the new name until we have uh, made the entire round. And uh, at the very end, I experience in the first sessions, oops, you forgot to debrief this and that topic. 
And uh, I'm, I make it a habit now so that I, I'm, I, I really not accidentally, but on purpose, I take out one of my messages and keep a kind of tension over the entire meeting. So at the very end, even if you are before time, there is one message to come. Yeah. And, uh, And uh, one day I didn't do it. And then uh, people are saying, and have you forgot something? I said, no, <laughs> there's nothing more. I only That's wish you a charming. pleasant day. And that was another surprise. So that you, you can make, make, make this kind of uh, experience that is working very well. And uh, yeah, it's a kind of meme uh, <laughs> yeah, in between. Yeah. So the forgotten topic. That's interesting. <laughs> uh, Now I have one last question from our colleague, Sandra. Yeah, it's, and uh, her question is more about how do you reach your target group with the relevant information for them, especially if this group is uh, yeah, a bigger group of people, not, not a sh small group of people. I would come back to one point I think that Andre already mentioned, which I, which I think um, mm. is also relevant in this context. And this is the significance of um, corporate influencers. And we were talking about enthusiasm. Um, I think you used the, the word a little earlier. Mm -hmm. um, You can't, of course, prescribe enthusiasm and, you know, getting your information through. But what you can do is actually dedicate time and, and energy um, to turn your employees into, into ambassadors or into corporate influencers. And I think their influence just must be, as I said, underestimated because they really take the company's topics on social media platforms. They convey them with a personal, authentic touch. Um, our messages gain a wider reach. They get a richer communication design, so to say. And um, of course, those people have to be enabled as well. And they have to have a chance, you know, to connect to top management, uh, to know their ideas. And therefore, we have established quite a lot of channels as well that really gives them this sort of, you know, information um, background that they need. And sometimes they know a little more as well, you know, because they need to know a little more than the others to, in order mm -hmm. to communicate the message um, properly. So give them first, first-hand learning opportunities, so to say, and, um, and also make them feel appreciated for what they do, because it is, of course, you know, I mean, it's the extra mile that they're going, yeah. it's the extra engagement. So yeah, um, make sure that they feel that the company sees and appreciates what they do just out of their intrinsic motivation. And I think this helps a lot in spreading, you know, messages, um, not just by the yeah, corporate yeah. communicators, but by mm. everybody. Yeah. And then that picture, um, just adding this to, to a statement, that, that picture has changed massively over the last years. I remember when, when joining DT and in, in the first years, the, the question was always, am I allowed to talk about DT? Can I use uh, my mm -hmm. social yeah. profile for this <laughs> and that? And then we started with this one. And then I would not say... Um, Insta and Facebook and LinkedIn were flooded with magenta posts. But if you now look and for sure, we select whom we are following, um, the different accounts, but you see so many posts and likes and uh, shared content, which is in according to our strategy and, and to our brand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So not disclosing secrets, but just letting the outside world know what, what are we and how we are working together. And this is something there's much more rumor than a couple of years ago. And uh, referring back to what, what Anne said, um, giving those kind of guardrails, not controlling um, th this kind of messages, but being sure that they on the same page. And this needs some routine that needs some development. And those people that are doing it, um, yeah, those, uh, those people, yeah, they, they, um, they are really valued members of a, of a bigger communication idea. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that everybody is into social media now. And um, one, I think one basic social media rule that really cannot be stressed often enough also is um, plan time for the community management because social media is an interactive channel and it just is not enough, you know, to get out your message and then hope that it will sort of, you know, find its way. But you have to uh -huh. interact with the community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and this really takes time. So make sure you involve them actively. But make also sure that you have time, you know, to do the community management so that they um, that they will come back. And I think these are the first sort of, you know, very basic rules um, to reach any target um, mm -hmm. target group. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah, basically not to forget the importance of social media or not to forget that you can use social media to your uh, own benefit and uh, use it 
to effectively communicate either yeah through the communicators or also with the ambassadors who play a yeah maybe a better role in this because reading a post from an employee is not the same as reading a post from a communicator. <laughs> it's it kind of hits differently. <laughs> True. <laughs> so um, we're reaching the end of our discussion today here. So I would like to finish it with one personal questions to you. So I want your own personal. Uh, key learnings that you took away from, yeah, from how we communicate. Maybe you found a favorite tool of communication that you're using, or you figured out something about your personality that you, how you communicate, maybe, or you have an epiphany uh, or deep realization of you or how people around you behave and communicate. Did you have some some sort of of understanding, realization, or or any learning from from this experience? For me, it's. Um take yourself not too serious and mm -hmm. um, bring some <laughs> bring some fun and color in communication um, mm -hmm. quick example um, we we shared some photographs um, from um, coffee latte art for example yeah doing an espresso and doing some <laughs> some milk and have some nice pictures so ah, the, yeah. that, that was one thing um, the other week uh, people shared uh, pictures from the sunset yeah And say, hey, this is what I see here. I, I would like to share this view. Yeah, it's office with a view or living room with a view, whatever. So, and and then maybe a video message, just a short message from what I have done. And it's not always related to business. That is, is coloring and spicing up a little bit um, our virtual community. And um, the key learning is, um, I, I miss I miss my office. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? And what about you, Anna? <laughs> well, actually, my key, key learning was um, the more, you know, we always say um, by COVID-19 that digitalization was accelerated. I think at the same time, you could see an enormous deceleration and people really, you know, tended to sort of slow down and paid value to or paid tribute to other values that, you know, they might have neglected before. So. My learning mm. really was, I mean, we know as communicators, um, you can, everything will become more digital. So this transformation will be ongoing, of course. And this is what we have to face. And you as communicator have also, you know, you, you have to get interested in, you know, the techni te technicality because you cannot do without it um, anymore. But at the same time, I think um, it is balanced. And this I found quite, um, yeah, satisfactory in a way by a strong sense of innerness, of, you know, mindfulness, mm -hmm. by, um, yeah, rebalancing your personal values. And I think if we manage to keep, you know, this balance also in communication, I think this could, you know, show us, a, show us the way the communication of the future might, might be. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you for, for sharing with us your, your key learnings, Anna and uh, Andre. It's very interesting. And I think some people might share Uh, the same uh, opinion as you, especially with the slowing down and, and yeah. really trying to find the balance when you're faced with uncertainty. Thank you very much for, for joining me. And we had a really interesting, amazing discussion. I want to talk more about communication, but uh, time's up. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. we will stop here. <laughs> thank and, you, mate. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, thank mate. You, thank yeah. you, Andre. So that's all, folks. Thanks a lot for tuning in to the TSE Talks and joining me today along with my guests. All in all, good communication keeps people engaged and connected to their sense of purpose in a time of uncertainty and rapid change. Therefore, it's very important for leaders to have great communication skills, use storytelling techniques, steer away from the one-size-fits-all approach and keep communication light, simple and not too serious. And most importantly, don't forget that socializing is very crucial in setting up people's moods. So always create moments to share small talks and connect with other people on topics other than work. Make sure to go to talks.tse.group, subscribe to our podcast and leave us a feedback. Our next episode will be about innovation culture in shared service centers. We will have a guest from the DSE and an external guest. So stay tuned. Thank you.